This video is going to be a discussion with my good friend John, which has been a prop trader for a very long time. I met him when I was at a firm, which I'm no longer associated with, and he was nice enough to come on the channel and talk about prop trading. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. You've been in that industry for how many years at this point? I started in 2006, so Dude, you're a vet. 18, 18 years at this point, or set, this is this is my 18th year. I guess it will be in September, September of this year. How did you actually get started, and how how did this all came about? It was honestly just it was it was partially luck of luck. Um, I I graduated from university in 2006. I was looking, you know, basically at the end of the big bull market. I was looking to get into Bank, I banking, sales and trading, um, all all those typical finance jobs that you hear about or you know hear people want to take and and try and do and I just couldn't get an interview for the life of me and you know I didn't have a bad GPA or anything I I graduated with a three three um, but you know but my friends they all had three five three six you know four O's they were all nerdy kids from Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, I just was just look, I kept looking around, kept looking around. I tried consulting and, and then I found I, I had liked I had started to invest. Um, I had a small brokerage account from some money from my parents and I had bought Under Armour and Netflix. They were both newer companies at those times. And I just thought it was cool. And, and I didn't have any clue to the scope of it. Right. I didn't realize people were day trading or prop trading or however they were doing it. I just wanted to find a way into it and into the, into finance. And I, 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 I kind of just stumbled onto this job opening at a prop firm and I had a good interview. The guys liked me because I was an athlete, went to a good university and it, I just, I kind of talked to my parents about it. And it was just one of those high risk to reward situations where I was young. Um, they gave you a salary for one year, something just to basically, you know, make ends meet. And I, I said, I'd give it like one or two years just to see what it is. And in the worst case scenario, I'll do what my dad did and just, you know, like what everyone else seems to do is just go get your MBA. Right. And then, then you can make it easier to transition. You know, and then I just happened to start. I'd be, I was a new guy in 2007 when everything was going crazy. So it was kind of, you know, even though I was new, there was so much volatility. It was as long as you kind of controlled your risk, you could make money, right? And even if you didn't do a good job of controlling your risk, as long as you didn't get out, there was enough intraday whipsaw where you could break even or even make money. And since I made money those first two years, I was like, well, I'll, I'll just see how it goes. <laughs> and then I just, it just, you know, I've been doing it ever since. Um, and then I was at that firm for uh, 12 years. And then I, I left to transition to a new firm. And I've been here since 2018. Because you've been there for, you were at your first firm for 12 years. So at this point, I would assume you were a senior trader? I guess technically, yes. Um, you know, when you look at my colleagues at LinkedIn, you know, it's a yeah, senior trader, managing trader, whatever it is. But there, I, in, in my view, there was no official terminology for that. That's normal. Yeah, it was no, no, no official terminology. Basically, how it worked is, you know, you became a you know, senior trader when you started training, training guys. Um, and after a couple of years, as long as you were profitable and you were there, you were working hard, you could take on some trainees and you could try to train them. And, 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 you know, basically your incentive to train them was, you know, you get a small portion of their P and L, um, you know, so I, I did that. I, I trained multiple people. I still talk to a couple of them that I, that still trade and, you know, and, and that's, that's how you, that's how you kind of build your way at that firm. Um, you, and, and, and I, and my friends that are still there, they all have a group, they all have a group of say three to 10 guys under them that are doing well. And, you know, while they're, it's just, a, you know, that little add on of, um, you know, PL at the end of the month or the year or whatever it might be. By the way, at any point during this video, don't forget to check out the links in the description. I did link all the tools I personally use in the description. Let's get back to the video. 
how many guys do you think continue trading after I, I guess starting out or after a couple of years? How many guys stayed or how many guys left? Uh, let me think here for a quick second. When I started, in my, so I started in 2006 and in my starting class, we had 25 kids. And within the first year, say, say within the first year, say five of them left, four or five of them left. And even though it was crazy, they, some of them just realized it wasn't for them. I, I, I want to say one kid actually quit within like a month and he just realized it wasn't for him realized it just wasn't prop trading in at this particular firm or in, in what he was getting himself into. He realized it wasn't for him and, you know, and for him, similar to me where I had a, you know, quote unquote backup plan, he was, he just went to, he applied and went to med school <laughs> and he so just did that. Um, I want to say that I bet you everyone's still trading or investing, um, but I bet you now there's, oh, let's see, one, two, three. I know of, of my friends that I started with, now there's five or six of us that still trade. So, I, and I think that's a pretty high percentage, right? When they, you know, especially when people talk about 90% failure rates. Um, but starting at a prop firm like that, it really gives you a good foundation. Um, and so the people that have made it and that are still trading, they have a good foundation. They know how to take advantage of high expected value situ situations, right? And, and they've made good money in, in, in the really big times and in, in, in the really big periods of time to help kind of sustain yourself, right? Um, you know, cause every year of trading is different. You know, and everyone's personality is different. You know, there, I know some traders that are, I know we're kind of going off topic here, here but some traders that are, are just real big home run, home run hitters, and they just know how to crush one or two years, and then they can sit dormant or they lose money for a year, and then they're just waiting for the next, they make so much money that they're just able to wait for the next really good time frame for their style of trading, you know, kind of like 2020, 2021, where I know people that made multiple eight figure years. And then they're now they're just biding their time waiting for that next really big cycle of, of craziness, basically. And, and maybe we're starting to see that with semiconductors. Do you think that's more common than what people think, how a PL curve goes or, or how would, how would you describe a, like an average trader PL curve? Is it like most likely like really big home run, like you just mentioned, or there's more like small hitters, like scalpers, I guess, that are maybe more making profit days in and day out. Yeah, so I, I, that's tough. That's a tough question. It's going to be personality based. Um, you know, I, I know I know a number of traders that are, are are very good at their process. They're very good at, and I don't want to call them scalpers. Um, you know, some of the, some of them are scalpers, and some of them are just very good process oriented day traders, where they're able to pull out whatever they whatever it is, a consistent, a consistent profit every single day, whether it's $500 or $5,000 based on risk tolerance. Right. And there's some traders who don't want to, they think that's a stressful day. They think it's stressful looking for opportunities each and every single day. I think the mis the misconception lies Personally, I think the misconception really lies when, when you see that graph inf infographic that a lot of people post, you know, there's 250 trading days in a year. Um, if you make $400 a day, that's $100,000, right? And I, I think the misconception is that people assume that every single day is equal. Um, everyone assumes that you just go in and you try to make $400 a day and you just, you do it on repeat for 250 days of the year. And that's just not, that's just not trading, right? Anyone who's listening to this problem is interested in the markets and they know that there is an ebb and flow in the market, whether you're a day trader or a swing trader, you know, yeah, things go from lower left to upper right, but it's, it's never in a straight line, right? It's up, you know, up, down, up, down. And depending on your time frame, those up downs are going to be on a one minute chart, you know, like this, or on a 15 minute chart like this, or on a daily chart like this. Right. And your, everyone's profit curve is going to be different. It's, it's going to come down to that person. 
but i there i know people that do it both ways so i can't say that you know one way is better or one ways more common than the other because some people like they have just saying or they would prefer to just sit there and wait for the trade where they really think they have high risk reward probability and making their twenty thousand dollars in one day but they might not make a trade for another two weeks versus the person that's trying to make two thousand dollars a day risking three hundred dollars at the time and just finding their particular good setups on their particular good time frames for that fit their personality this is a lot of what i've seen in my experience in prop trading which was about which felt odd at first because when i came from retail to prop at i thought you're supposed to be like trading like hardcore every day every day just taking trades and trades because now you have almost unlimited buying power in most cases like you know you have to be worried about margin buying power fees are going to be lower than than your average broker i would say and you know it's just something so new that you think that now you get to you get to trade or you have the permission to just you know take every trade that comes comes around and this is how you should be making money and it also i think comes from podcast that there's a misconception about it that you know you you get on a desk and now you're supposed to just go off the rail and just scalp everything that moves and all that stuff and then i had a i would say my first mentor or manager which was the absolute opposite you know it's a guy that would just sit there wait five days for his setup hit it with decent size make money and then just watch youtube or poker or review trades and all that stuff and then i'm there exhausted every day just taking trades after trades after trades and then you know when i show him my trade he just looks confused of like what did i do on that day like why did you trade 16 tickers when the guy i've been trading in four days so i think that could be a good uh, a good starting point to ask how was training at your first firm and how did it work to maybe pair you with like a, a manager Yeah, it's, it's funny that you brought that all up because I, I, that's how exactly how I was trained. I was trained to, and, and again, it, it's, it's, it's kind of luck of the draw, right? Um, my manager just taught me to scalp. He was a scalper. He taught me to scalp and he was so good at it. You know, like he could read the level two, like, like no other. And he had such a good feel for the stocks that he traded. And it was just, he was just on repeat, just repeat every single day, you know, make a thousand to three thousand dollars every single day, like it was nothing. Come in and be done by ten thirty and just and he would record his days for me and I would just I'd watch him over and and then I'd watch him with my group once I started training people and just I just couldn't I couldn't figure it out. Right. It just it it, it just that you know everyone thinks differently. Everyone everyone interprets information differently, right? Whereas some people at that firm were trained by the guys, you know, like your, your mentor, where they're looking for extreme special situations, um, whether it's an order flow situation or breaking news. And even though we're all on the same floor, right, it goes to show how people were able to branch out and figure out what worked for them. Right. And it really took me until leaving that firm and going off my own to really figure out what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it and, and, and really hone in my process. So like, I feel as if my, the last three or four years, I've been a beginner trader again, as I've really had to redefine my rules and really had to redefine my strategies and, and what I want to do and how I want to do it. Um, uh, but, but so, but I think a miscon a, like, so the misconception definitely lies like, So some prop traders trade a lot and some people don't, right? Like people think that just because you're at a prop firm, you have, you don't have to trade. Like the prop firm just gives you the, the best thing about the prop firm, I would say, is that it gives you forced risk management, right? And that's, that's the big thing They'll, you get the leverage, which is amazing. You get so much more leverage than if you're a retail broker, right? Where you get, you're limited to four to one intraday and two to one overnight. If you're at a different type of firm, like my old firm, you know, where you could be fully backed, your buying power increases based on how well you've done and how long you've been there. So 
it's just they're there it's a different little bit different than retail but it doesn't necessarily you know the amount that you trade isn't going to be more or less necessarily and I think you mentioned something pretty important and it's uh, that maybe the type of deal that you can get at a prop firm so I can go a bit about it but there's going to be a different type of firm that offers sometimes fully backed or capital contribution so you want to take the lead on this and maybe explain a bit more yeah so um, when I the firm that I first started at and there's a couple like this out there they're all it's they're all firms that they want to train you when you start within their ranks and you get a certain amount of buying power, your losses are covered um, and you basically learn their strategies, learn from a mentor who sits next to you and works with you every single day. And then you work together as a group and you just, you really build up your, um, your playbook, right? And there's no expectations. There's no like expectation of how much money you need to make, but you know, but as long as you're profitable, everyone's happy. And then, every six months or a year, you would have a conversation basically and like where you progressed and, you know, um, are you using your full buying power? Like, are you hitting your lockout? Like, do we need, and then, and then raising those limits as you grow as a trader. Um, and, and that's like the fully backed version. And the other part of that is, um, you usually have to like leave a small percentage of your of your P and L with with the firm, and you know it's like a deferred compensation, you know just in case you take a big drawdown or a big loss, um, you know they don't want to take the, the full hit on that. But if you leave, like when I left, I I, I got my deferred compensation that I still had there. Um, and then the other side of prop trading is where I'm at now, um, where you can contribute capital, and this type of firm. It's usually for traders who have experience. They don't want someone to just blow through their own capital. And the firm's risk management is that I, if, if for whatever reason something goes crazy, if um, if my positions go crazy against me, whatever my equity level gets to zero, it's like a quick conversation and like auto liquidate. Um, unless it's something like flash crash, they won't auto liquidate you because obviously they'll see that it's it's crazy. But the assumption is is that they'll get, you know, they have on their end the risk management and where it's like, all right, equities at zero, equities at zero, message them what's going on. Are you just being stupid? You know, blow them out. You know, you need to, you know, you're at zero, right? Because because at, under zero, it's, then it's their capital at risk, right? So it, they're just, there's two, it's just two different, um, totally different business um, businesses. So the capital contribution, I guess it's, it's pretty good for people that do know how to trade because then they also get to keep a bigger percentage of their profit, which is normally very, very high. Like you're almost keeping everything versus when you're on a fully bagged deal because the firm takes the risk, they're going to take a substantial amount of profit, which sometimes as people get better and more profitable or depending on where they're in their career, some deal might be way better to go on capital contribution versus fully backed, I would assume. Uh, yeah, yes and no. Um, yes and no. Uh, just because, like, so, like I said, I, I have friends, you know, so, for example, the, the fully backed, the fully backed um, deal, you know, you, you kind of start closer to 50-50 and then you kind of work your way up. And, and, they, and that model has changed over the last, you know, 20 years in my previous firm because people left. People left for these other types of firms. Um, but I have friends that are still there and, and they'll never, they will probably never leave. Um, just because they never want that stress of trading their own money, right? They never want the stress of, of like, what if, right? I, I, in the back of my mind, like, what if I go on a really bad negative streak and then I have to put up my own money again, right? Whereas if they take a big loss, they, if they want to, they can just stay there and, and work themselves out of it, right? And, or, or they can kind of leave and, and maybe they can find another place that will, that will back them, you know, based on their on their track record. Um, what was the other half of that question? Who would be better on a fully backed or capital contribution? Oh, right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just don't think I don't. You know, again, and this comes down to like risk tolerance, right? It's it's all personality based. Everyone's going to be a different. Everyone's going to be different. Some people might like trading their own money 
because they don't know how to increase their risk, right? They, so they might, it might be better for them to see that their account is growing every single day and month. Whereas at a, you know, when I was fully back, you're just, it, you're, it's just like purely P&L shop and it's just, you're getting paid out on your P&L. My buying power stayed the same all the time. My risk stayed the same, same all the time, whether it was up or down X, right? Whereas if you're trading your own account, you can see that up account balance grow and you can see that growth, you know, it's in front of your face a little bit more versus, you know, trading P you know, like a P and L trading based shop, um, or firm, you know, and, and so it, it's not one way is not better than the other for sure. It just, it's still, it's still going to come down to what, what works for you, for you. Right. There's no, there's no right answer. Yeah. And we all, we had that discussion before, but, You've seen um, maybe more on your side. I haven't heard that too much. I always thought that if people had the chance to go prop at a legit firm, they would do it. But um, to start to trade like prop with like a legit firm in New York or in the States, uh, you also need your license. And it just seemed that people don't want to get their license, their SIE or their 57. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. It, you know, so again, like when I first started, not again, but when I first started, I, I had to take a series seven and 56 and, um, my firm was a broker dealer at the time and my current firm's a broker dealer. Um, and then, you know, like you're, like you just mentioned, now you have to, now you have to take a SIE test and a 57, two different tests. I actually have no idea what they are. Um, but people still have to, you have to study for them. And, and I was able to get an exemption, right? There now my, my firm now, my old firm now, and a couple other firms, they've, they've changed their structure. So they're not broker dealers anymore. And they're just set up as, as a hedge fund structure. So the traders don't actually have to be licensed it, when you're trading, um, one pool of money that's without outside investors, the firm can set up, set themselves up that way. Um, you know, and, and they're going to have different roles, different types of reporting roles. I, you know, I don't know all the back end stuff, but my friends that are still there, they, they've, because so much time has passed, like their licenses have lapsed. And when I came over to my new firm, I was going to have to take my test, but I got lucky and was able to get an exemption from the exchanges because I had them and I was still doing the same thing, but my, because my firm had changed their structure they granted the exemption for me. Yeah. So that type of deal, it's because um, what I believe is it's one or segregated account. I think that's how you say it. It's um, like the, everybody trades a separate account versus if the whole, all the traders trade just one account at the firm. So the only issue that they can have is if everyone is short or everyone is long, then into an SSR stock to exit the position, you have to locate some shares. It could be, it could get messy at certain times, but uh, for the most part, it doesn't change much. For the trader, it doesn't change much. It's just easier for them to at least get started because these licenses are quite, when I had to do them, the SIE was, I felt like it was really hard. It was like a good month, a good month of studying full time, no trading, nothing, just like really full time. And the 57, this one was easier because it was about trading. So they're asking question about option and trading and all these little things. So it's very in your field versus the other one was about uh, insurance on bank account and a bunch of other stuff that if you've been just trading for, I don't know, three years prior to that, or you haven't studied necessarily finance, you just have like, you're unaware. And also I'm in Canada, you know, yeah. what do I know about us banks? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so little things like this. So, and all right. So would you say that prop trading is different than retail trading or maybe the strategy that some firm have wouldn't really be or retail trader are not exposed to? I think, I think that over the last, say, five to eight, five to say ten years, um, there's been a real rise and change of retail trading, right? And and you, you know, I'm not even just talking about Reddit and 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 the meme stocks. I think even in terms of um, a lot of people who have done well and, and they've left prop firms. For the most part, the strategies can can be the same. I think that I think that 
a lot of the technicalities are different. Like you learn a lot more of the technicalities as a prop trader, at least my old, my, my old firm. Like you learned all the nuances between where orders route to and how orders work. And you have access to, you know, different types of scanners and, and, and proprietary technology where everything was built for us. Like everything, all the scanners, all the charts, all the execution and order entry, it was all built for us. They had all different sorts of, you know, proprietary tech for us to use and, and to try to take advantage of every of everything, right? Versus a retail trader when they're starting out. You know, let's start with the basic retail trader who might just use Thinkorswim, right? Or or interactive brokers or E-Trade. You know, the majority of those traders they might not even, some of them might look at the level two and, 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 and look, in, look into liquidity. You know, I, I know that there are a lot that I'm sure they do, right? Like, especially if you use DAS through Centerpoint or Cobra, but that's like the next evolution of retail trader to me, right? Whereas, you know, some day traders might just go into their think or swim. They might look, go look at, you know, today is January 30th at you know 2:45, and recently, Mark had news a 20 cent stock, and they might have just gone to Think and Swim, just buy me 50,000 shares, right? They don't care about execution. They don't care about the level two, what it's looking like. They don't, you know, they might not even look at the technicals. I'm sure they have a chart up, right? But they might just might, might just buy it, right? The next evolution of retail trader is going to be someone who's using DAS on Cobra or center point, for example, and they're looking at the level two and they see they're probably only getting level one data, right? Which is the top of every single ECN and exchange on their, on their order entry window. So they don't even see the whole depth, the full depth of it. Um, you can get into seeing the entire the total book of NASDAQ, ARCA, BEGEX, BATS, all of the ECNs. And then if you're lucky, you can get IEX, you can get UBS, Goldman Sachs, you know, other market makers that are prominent players. And you can see all of that data as well, right? And you can start looking to see where liquidity is on the tape. You can start watching the prints closer and you can, you can look to see what the venue of the prints are you know, and, and understanding the letters of the, of the prints, you know, that, and that's, a, that's like a prop trader nugget, right? Or, or a piece of information that I learned, you know, all the letters, what exchange it means. It helps you find buyers and sellers on those exchanges. And, and it might give you clues and might give you an edge to, to what's happening, right? Um, and I think that's kind of like where, like that intricate knowledge um, is, is, is where some of, a lot of it changes. Um, I have friends in my old firm that, my old firm and other firms that are really big into trading these stocks that are halting. Like a lot of stocks, a lot of these small cap stocks halt a lot now, right? And if you have a direct access platform, like at a prop firm, or I'm pretty sure DAS has it as well, um, you're getting all of the imbalance information, right? So if something, something halts limit up, at say ten dollars, and then you can see where the indication is going to be, how many shares are being paired, um, versus think or swim, or if you're just trading, you know, something like that. You kind of have you're kind of like trading in the dark, right? And someone might someone might not know that the trading halts are five five minutes, right? Or if it's not five minutes, it's going to be ten minutes, and if it's not 15, ten minutes, it's going to be fifteen minutes. So we, it's always a five minute band. Right, and then the next part of that is the band ex increases by three percent every five minutes. So if the stock halts at ten, and it's it needs to open within, I want to say th I want to say three percent. I, I could be wrong, but it, if it doesn't, if it's not indicating to open within three percent, that's how you know it's going to be a ten minute halt, right? And and if something indicates so high, it's going to keep going until the band increases in width wide enough to, to, to find that imbalance price. And then that's, the, that's where the stock's gonna open. And it's some of those little nuggets 
are, are, the, are the differences where, that you learn in a, at, a, at a prop firm just because other people are doing it, other people are looking at those things versus, versus a retail trader. But it doesn't mean the retail trader can't learn those things, right? Because if they're that, say, hybrid retail using DAS or Sterling or Lightspeed, they, can, they have access to that information as well and, and can do that. So it's more about knowing that this information means something and how, what you can do with it versus having access. Yeah, yes, yeah. And, and like, for me, like, that's not my style of trading. I don't like trading those things. I don't like trading that style. It doesn't fit my personality. But I've made it one of my goals to this year to understand those, to try, see if I can find the patterns that exist. Um, I, I prefer to trade mid or large cap names. So the, I want to find the patterns that exist in those mid to large cap names that, that go limit up or limit down. W what's the, the change in the price and the change in the imbalance size? Does it lead to a reversal? Does it lead to a continuation? You know, and, and try to find those patterns out. Would you mean um, on these mid or large cap, would you consider it like when we had the bank's name that were halting or? Yes, exactly. Something like that. So something like that back Mar last March when, you know, all those mid cap banks or, and, you know, Schwab, uh, direct brokers, all those types of things that were, when they were halting limit up or down or, or something that happened more recently, like save, right? Save recently had some news with JetBlue um, that their deal was being blocked, right? It goes down, limit down, and um, you know, and then it opened up, say, a dollar lower, right? I, I, approximately. Um, so things like that. So that's something that more that I'd be willing to trade because real company, real news, um, and versus something like ZJYL or another Chinese Ponzi stock, where someone is controlling the flow and you can't control your risk. Right. And, and, you know, I, I find it hard to control my risk when something's halting over all the time because you don't know where it's going to open up next. It, it's, it's a little bit out of your control, but at least if it's a real company, my view is that there's a little bit less of that tail risk versus shorting something or trying to long or bounce something that could be a liquidation or a Ponzi, right? Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing with uh, halt on the small caps versus on the mid. Because if it's halting on a mid cap or large cap, it's going to be there's like there's news to so most likely directionality. I would assume, you know, there's always a a, bounce, a random bounce that can happen, but as a whole, there, there's more chance that, like you said, like there's less fat tail risk on it. Like even if you take a, a bad beat on it it won't be your whole account plus more. It should just be like a, a decent size loss, I would assume. This conversation was just the first of many, but don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the show and also leave a comment down below if you have any question that you would like us to answer. Peace.